Hello, and welcome to Independent Thinking, the weekly podcast from Chatham House. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, the director. This week, we are focusing on Sudan. We are asking whether the world has forgotten what United Nations officials have called one of the worst humanitarian nightmares in recent history. It's been almost a year since the Sudanese military and the paramilitary rapid support forces went to war. And since April last year, the capital Khartoum has borne the brunt of the fighting, having been divided in two by these warring factions, as has the rest of Sudan. And of course, it's Sudan's people who are enduring horrendous suffering as a result, caught between these two heavily armed factions who appear unwilling to back down. That, in our view, is reason alone to focus on this conflict. 18 million people are at risk of hunger and reports of widespread atrocities evoke memories from the darkest days of Omer al-Bashir's rule. That's the former president ousted in a coup in 2019. More of him later. There are also considerations about who might have an interest in continuing this nightmare, with credible reports of foreign actors such as the UAE, the Emirates, Russia's Wagner Group, and even Ukrainian special forces operating in the war, with implications beyond Sudan's borders. Well, I have a great panel to discuss these really disquieting questions. Returning to the podcast is Mohamed al Taishi, a civilian member of Sudan's Sovereignty Council, which is an 11-member transitional council that acted as the collective head of state in the aftermath of the 2019 revolution. And in that role, he served as the chief negotiator and the main architect of the Juba Peace Agreement of 2020. Mohammed, you joined us about a year ago on the podcast from Khartoum itself, and you're now in Dubai. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. Great. Really looking forward to discussing it with you. Also joining us is BBC journalist James Copnell, who's covered Sudan extensively. Welcome. Thank you. Real pleasure to be here. Really, really good to have you. And finally, back on the podcast as well is Rosalind Marsden, an associate fellow with our Africa program and the former UK ambassador to Sudan. You also joined us on that episode a year ago. Welcome back. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be taking part. Well, I'm glad to have you all here. You're all immersed in what is happening in Sudan. But for the benefit of the many who we argue are not paying attention to this, but should be, I wonder if we could just first discuss some of the basics of the current state of the war in Sudan. Mohammed, I wonder if you could take us through the different sides in this war. Who is fighting whom? Well, this is um, an EO war. It started in 15 April 2023 and almost now uh, one year since this war brought up between the RSF, uh, Rapid Support Forces, and South Sudanese Army. During this year, there is many uh, engaged on this um, war, uh, regionally, domestically, there is many groups join this war, but I think uh, regionally and internationally, there is some figures also involved to this uh, war. So. It is a war inside the Sudan soil, but I think is now split. There is another power, another regionals get involved to this to this war. That's what the most uh, worrying on this ongoing uh, conflict. And James, can you just explain who these two sides are? The Sudan Armed Forces, the SAF, and the Rapid Support Forces, who were previously government militias, weren't they? Yeah, sure. So the Rapid Support Forces came out of the Janjawi, the Arab militia groups that became infamous around the world during the Darfur Civil War 20 years ago. So these were irregular uh, groups that were used by the Sudanese state to help it put down one of the numerous rebellions in Sudan's history. And was that President Omar al-Bashir? Under President Omar al-Bashir. And he then used them in a more formal way as a sort of form of protection. He used a method of keeping several different military groups powerful so that he thought none would overthrow him. The Sudanese armed forces are the country's army, responsible in the eyes of many for atrocities in Darfur, but also in South Sudan before it became independent in 2011, in South Kordofan and Blue Nile and many other Sudanese conflict zones. So these are two groups, both with a lot of blood on their hands who worked together to take power from Omar al-Bashir when civilian protests became very strong, to then overthrow a civilian government. And they were hand in hand in running the country before they fell out and are now fighting each other. 
and they fill out. Is it for personal reasons at the top? Is it for reasons of principle? I don't think there's huge amounts of principle. Uh, I think the Sudanese armed forces has always felt that it had a national role. That's probably what they would consider their principle, that they are the guardians of the country's sovereignty. And yet many people all over Sudan and what's now South Sudan will have complaints about the way they were treated, about their relatives killed by the Sudanese armed forces. The Rapid Support Forces is a much more classic militia group, one that became very rich, and certainly its leader, Mohammed Hamdan Begalo, known widely as Hameti, by using its troops in the Yemeni civil war, uh, backed by the United Arab Emirates at the time, gained in power and control. I think it got to a point, there were tensions about reintegrating the RSF within the Sudanese armed forces, about who saw themselves or wanted to portray themselves, perhaps more accurately, as the guardians of the revolution, the people's revolution against Omar al-Bashir. But in fact, the people didn't want either in charge. They didn't want the Sudanese armed forces and they didn't want the RSF. And ultimately, yes, then it comes down to a clash of ambition between those at the top in both movements wanting to be the sole com- in control. And would you say that that is still true, that the people really, if asked, would prefer neither? Absolutely. I think it's very, very clear that the demand of the Sudanese civilians is for freedom, peace and justice. It's for a country without a military presence at the top. And it's probably worth noting that throughout Sudan's history, military rule has been much more common than civilian rule. So the military has been in power in one form or another with Omar al-Bashir or other leaders at many points throughout Sudan's history. But the people's desires, shown for the huge numbers who took to the streets, who risked their lives to protest, is for a civilian-led country. And Rosalind, where are other countries outside Sudan in this? We've talked a bit about the UAE. Perhaps you could unpack that a bit for us. But where where are other countries, Egypt, even the UK? Well, broadly speaking, Egypt, I think, is seen as the strongest the strongest backer of the Sudanese armed forces, although more recently, Iran has also entered the scene. Saudi Arabia is perceived to lean a bit towards the Sudanese armed forces, but unlike the United Arab Emirates, it's not clearly taken sides. Instead, it, it's been keen to play a, a sort of diplomatic role as, and brand itself as a mediator. So, first of all, with Egypt, I mean, the Egyptian army really sees the Sudanese armed forces as a reflection of itself and the only institution that can control Sudan. Many Sudanese army officers, including Bohan, trained in in Egypt, and the the army had a military cooperation agreement with Egypt um, since uh, March 2021. And Egypt believes for historical and national security reasons including its need for Sudan's support in ensuring its water security in negotiations over Ethiopia's Grand Renaissance Dam, that it needs to play a leading role in Sudanese affairs. So we we saw them towards the end of 2022, when the US, the UK, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia were trying to push the framework agreement to restore the democratic transition. Egypt tried to basically create its own parallel process by supporting an alternative political bloc that had been composed of political elements who had supported the military coup. But there seems to have been recently some evolution in Egypt's position. In January, they took part in talks in Manama, in Bahrain, with the Emirates, with the Americans, the Saudis and Bahrain, which was significant because for the first time, Egypt and the UAE have been supporting the opposing sides had come together in a mediation Which effort. in a complex picture makes it, I guess, one bit simpler. But that's on the sort of the, the SAF side. And they've, because of the need, their, their need for to try to get some advanced drones, they've re-established re- diplomatic relations with Iran, which had uh, had been severed back in 2016. So the prospect of Iran having a presence on Sudan's 750 kilometre Red Sea coast at a time of heightened military tension is obviously something likely to cause concern to Western governments, but also to Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And just on those Western governments, what part is the UK playing? Well, the UK has been quite heavily engaged. Um, Andrew Mitchell, the Minister for Africa, has just been to Eastern Chad to, to see the, the Darfuri refugees who are, who are there. They've announced a doubling of UK aid. The UK has played a leading role in the UN Human Rights Council in trying to um, raise the issue of human rights, they, which led to the establishment of a UN fact-finding mission. The U- UK has imposed sanctions on the financial networks of the, of the two sides. They've used its role in the UN Security Council as the pen holder to push for a resolution which called for a ceasefire during Ramadan, which, of course, did not materialise. And importantly, they've also been providing support to Sudan's democratic civilian forces, 
and trying to amplify their voices. And that's a really crucial. So the UK is not backing either of these two sides. It's really pushing for a resolution that includes more of the civilian voices. Absolutely. They're backing the democratic civilians. But those are all the positives. But at the same time, I would just emphasize that much more needs to be done by the UK and its international partners to put pressure on the warring parties to agree to a ceasefire and particularly more pressure on their regional backers to stop fueling the war. And if the countries in the Gulf uh, and the Egypt and others are going to take Western governments seriously, they really need to engage at a very senior political level. I think that's crucial. And the war in Sudan needs to be raised by foreign ministers and heads of government with their counterparts in these countries. And they need to talk about the war in Sudan in their public interviews alongside the wars in Gaza and Ukraine. So, Mohammed, we've had that complex background laid out for us. What is the situation now in Khartoum? Generally, the war expanded uh, much more than when it just started. Now, you can see um, the whole Darfur uh, region and the whole Kurdufan uh, region, the whole um, Khartoum state, and mostly the whole Al Jazeera uh, state engage very much on the conflict. The vast majority of these areas controlled by South, however, from the eastern uh, states, from Gadarif and Kassala and beyond to the Red Sea, where South controlling those areas and trying to engage on the war in, into these uh, areas controlled by, by RSF. In the humanitarian basis, as you just um, uh, said in your introduction, the Sudanese people experience um, the most the most humanitarian crisis ever in their uh, history. So it's it's a bad situation. And the ongoing war is created everywhere. You can hear every time reported uh, a conflict from Khartoum, from Al Jazeera, from somewhere else in the uh, White Sea as well. So this is a very active conflict on the ground. And, and I think also both sides, both war side uh, preparing for a uh, more conflict. Yesterday, we heard a statement from uh, Burhan and we heard a statement from uh, Hemeti. Um, fortunately, the state came up from uh, Burhan as no promising, as no hopes for the Sudanese people. There is an, a will to go for uh, uh, a peace. It is about war, it is about uh, fight. So the situation is more more worse than this war uh, started. What about the humanitarian situation? How bad is that? The humanitarian situation, I mean, is so bad. I mean, for so, so long time, I think five months ago, the humanitarian uh, access has no uh, way to the Sudan uh, residents, where in Darfur, even in Kurdufan, and indeed in, in Khartoum and Jazeera. So the population running out of food, running out of medicine, running out of uh, services, no mention to uh, electricity, no mention to the communication services, no mention to the uh, hospital uh, facilities. So it is as devastated as you can imagine. There is no access. And I think a famine being experienced in many, many groups in, in, in Sudan. And have to mention the season is just arrived. The, the rain season is just arrived. And that's where you can get the humanitarian even more uh, worse. Until now, there is no such strong and concrete agreement between any of these two uh, war parties to get access to the, the civilians. There is no uh, preparation even for uh, a negotiation to come up with a solution or even a temporary uh, solution to get access, humanitarian access to the uh, Sudanese uh, people. The only option now being left for the Sudanese people is to flee the country to the neighborhood countries where they facing absolutely a devastating situation where in Ethiopia or even in South Sudan and, or, or in Egypt. I visited many Sudanese uh, communities in Uganda, in Ethiopia, in Egypt last month, and I can hear as a complaint, as a bad picture about the life of those people, as you can just imagine. So unfortunately, inside the country, outside the country, Sudanese people never experienced a good situation. Mohammed, thank you. A really grim picture. 
James, is this what we're looking at, the beginnings of a huge exodus of people? Yeah, look, it's it's already started. Uh, something like eight or nine million people displaced within the country. Well over a million have left to Chad, to South Sudan, to Egypt, and to elsewhere. The people who haven't left, in many cases, in conflict zones, simply can't. It's expensive or too dangerous, or people are too sick to travel. So I know people still in Omdurman, for example, who see artillery shells going over their head every day, who collect spent bullets from the courtyard where their children are playing, who are dealing with that sort of reality of conflict. And of course, in those very difficult circumstances, almost everyone who can flee will flee. I mean, to put it into a British context, the conflict in the capital, it's like Buckingham Palace being bombarded, the London Eye tumbling into the Thames. It's like the British Museum burnt and abandoned. And millions of people around struggling to survive, not knowing in some cases where their next meal will come from. There's something not unique, but extremely unusual about a war taking place in the capital city, the capital being completely devastated. And that's not to say that past Sudanese wars in Darfur or what's now South Sudan or other places are less devastating for the people involved, but it does call into question why there hasn't been more attention around the world, why it's possible that you have famine in a capital city of a major country, and there hasn't been more attention, why there's not more funding from the international community. I think the UN say it gets around 4 or 5% of the resources it needs to deal with the devastating humanitarian situation, why one out of two children in the country are facing conflict in some form or another. And that's not to talk about the other problems of malnutrition, kids being out of education, and And famine, why do you think really- it is that it hasn't had that that attention. Obviously, we have the conflict in Gaza, we have the the war in Ukraine. Is it those? Yeah, I think, look, that's a major part of it. I think for many people, certainly in the Western world, the conflict in Ukraine felt like an existential threat, given the possibility of nuclear war at some point, given that for Europeans, Ukraine appeared as part of Europe. Gaza and Israel, that conflict cuts across so many fault lines, apparently in Western countries in terms of religion and and, and culture and so on. And it's a place where there will always be a huge focus. But I don't think that should mean that the world could or should disregard what is happening in Sudan. I think race may be part of it, that in Britain, for example, people are more willing to think about Ukrainian refugees as being more similar to how they imagine uh, British people are, perhaps. That question That is certainly one charge identity. that has come out from uh, Palestinian supporters, saying, why don't you care about these refugees as much as you do about Ukrainian ones? And you hear that from Sudanese a lot. They say Ukrainians are suffering a huge amount, and they find it relatively easy to come to the UK as refugees. Sudanese, no. And of course... There is a long historic relationship between Britain and Sudan from a colonial period onwards. So it's not like there are no ties between Britain and Sudan. But for whatever reason, it is not easy for a Sudanese refugee to make it to the UK or a Sudanese person fleeing conflict and persecution. And of course, I suppose we in the media as a journalist, we have to take our share of responsibility that we haven't been able to convince the world of the gravity of the situation in Sudan. Rosalind, can we just go back to this point of what the UK can actually do? I happened to be talking to Andrew Mitchell when he was in Chad, although about a different conflict in which the UK hopes to help. And it really brought to my mind about what it is that the UK is trying to do in these circumstances. Well, I think, you know, the UK has got very close relations with the United Arab Emirates, with the Saudis, with the Egyptians. So I think they really need to, you know, expend some political capital in really urging these countries to work together uh, in a collective effort to try to come up with a coherent and coordinated mediation process. I think, as I mentioned, there was some perhaps possibly promising signs with the talks in Bahrain in in January, but there was now talk, um, including from the new US special envoy, Tom Perello, who's been extremely active in hoping that perhaps the Jeddah platform can resume, but maybe in an expanded format, bringing in some of these other actors who have leverage on the two sides. Just tell us what the Jeddah platform is. Well, shortly after the war started, the Americans and the Saudis joined forces to try to broker a ceasefire 
And they tried a number of times to get short-term ceasefires, all of which were broken almost immediately by the warring sides. There was then a further effort late last year, which also didn't lead to any tangible difference on the ground. But I think there's a sense now that although there are so many reasons to be pessimistic, at the same time, seeing that Sudan is heading for a major famine, that the longer the war continues, the more it's likely to evolve into an ethnicized civil war, and the more fragmented the command and control is likely to become on both sides. That if we don't want this to become a a civil war lasting years, as some of Sudan's previous wars have done, some really urgent diplomatic action needs to be taken at a senior level to try to get the generals to change their calculations. Mohammed, do you think there's a risk of the country splitting in two? Well, the situation in Sudan, it has been always a risk of splitting uh, in many different parts. We already experienced that division in 2010. And I think, I think unless the Sudanese people really stop this war and coming up with a comprehensive political process where they can address all the root causes and include many Sudanese stakeholders on that political process, always the divided country is be, would be there. However, there is a name it organization for a long time promoted for where they call it Al Bahran Al Nahar, the Red and the Sea uh, State, and I think I think there is a lot of literature about that. Seeing to the conflict in Libya just across the border, and you can see you can see this element right now. However, the the vast majority of the Sudanese people don't like this uh, scenario. The civilians, the politicians, don't like this uh, scenario, but the risk is always be, be there. And how destabilizing is this for Central Africa? You were talking about the spread of people, the exodus of people and so on. But what does this mean for the neighbors? Well, it means a lot. You know, as Rosalind just mentioned, for those countries to get involved in this conflict directly or indirectly, something to do with the history. So the politics in Chad uh, historically be leaked about what is going on in, in, in Sudan. And also have to mention that to the South Sudan, the very recent country, have to mention that to the Eritrea and, uh, and also uh, uh, Egypt. So always the conflict in Sudan being a regional case. And this time it would be uh, even more case than ever before. So one of the main issues, that's why the regional countries and internationals have to deal, should to deal with the, uh, the conflict in Sudan precisely because this conflict's always been a conflict of the region. And if you mention uh, Iran in the heart of this conflict, and you don't need to get away from what is going on in Yemen, which is we are sharing a strategic uh, security uh, border where the Red Sea is going to join all these uh, uh, nations together. So not only the regional, not only the African countries, but also the Red Sea, where it affects us as far as UK, uh, EU, Western country, because all the business is going strategically through this uh, very uh, window. So I think the international need to recognize the conflict in Sudan is the conflict of the international crisis and have to deal with it unless it would be too late. And that would affect the neighbor's country. You can see now, for example, the oil issues between South Sudan and Sudan. So, uh, for example, South Sudan uh, partly depended on the outcome of the oil going through the Sudan. Now that's been stopped for last month. And you can see the local currency in, in Juba rise it 200% comparing with the last six, last six months. So that's almost the affection is there. And when the country like South Sudan affected economically or with the conflict in Sudan, that means politically is going to affect and that means uh, security is going to be uh, affected as well. So absolutely, the conflict in Sudan is the conflict of the region and we have to deal with it as soon as possible. Mohammed, thank you for that. And you've made a powerful case for why this matters, not just to the region, but to certainly Europe and many other countries. James, do you feel this is escalating? And we've been talking um, about Iran getting involved, about this now, as Mohammed puts it, being another security threat to the Red Sea. 
Yeah, look, that's a clear uh, trend. I think that the longer the conflict continues, the more support the warring parties are determined to attract, and that necessarily, given the current destruction in the country, has to come from abroad. So Iran getting more heavily involved on the side of the Sudanese armed forces would certainly raise hackles in Western capitals and, and other places. And Iran's reason for doing that? Presumably access to the Red Sea, uh, I would have thought, would be would be a key one, and, and that uh, critical shipping corridor as well. Uh, Chad, I think it's worth looking at as well. As Mohammed was saying, Chad and Sudan's destiny has always been quite linked. There are ethnic groups that go across the border. There are Sudanese-backed rebellions in Chad that almost overthrew presidents and vice versa. Sudanese rebels who almost overthrew the government in Khartoum, backed by Chad. So the role of Chad is extremely uh, important. I want to bring it back, though, to the Sudanese people, because there is a real risk of widespread famine. And in fact, many Sudanese believe famine is already there, that people are dying and simply the international community who tends to monitor these things and adjudicate these things is not in a position to get everywhere and see what is happening. And so the longer the conflict continues and the longer both sides, and in fact there are more than two sides, um, but the two major players believe they can still win a conflict, the worse things will get with the all the risks we've talked about. And if you go back into Sudanese history, if you're talking about the conflict in Darfur, which broke out in 2003, still not fully resolved today, even feeding into the current war. If you look at decades of North-South conflict before South Sudan seceded, if you look at problems in the east of Sudan or conflicts in South Kordofan and Blue Nile, other parts of the country, nobody ever wins a war in Sudan. It goes on and on and on. And the suffering for the civilians continues and the burden on neighboring countries increases But ultimately, it comes to some sort of negotiation and some sort of deal because no one can ever win a conflict in a country in which perhaps geographically it's simply not possible to do so. So at some point, there will have to be a negotiation. And I just think the Sudanese people are desperate for that to happen right now. But at the moment, we're in a very turbulent time in the world. Rosalind, is Russia involved? And we talked earlier about the Wagner Group. The Wagner Group, which has, I think, now been, uh, since Prigozhin's death, has now been renamed the sort of Africa Corps has certainly been reported to be supporting the rapid support force, providing some military supplies. But at the same time, the Russian government, uh, if you look at uh, what they say in the UN Security Council, looked as though it's supporting the the Sudanese armed forces and the de facto authorities in Port Sudan. So I think the Russians have an interest in gold, which much of Sudan's gold has been exported to Russia or smuggled to Russia and used to fund Putin's Ukraine war. At the same time, they also have ambitions to get a naval base on the Red Sea coast. And I think there they see they've been in discussions for a long time with the authorities uh, and now in Port Sudan. So they seem to basically be ready to support whoever comes out on top in order to pursue their interests. You were making a point to me about how this is really a legacy of the Omer al-Bashir years. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it's important to get the narrative and the framing of this conflict right. I mean, the the war is between two military actors who are essentially creations of the Bashir regime. The paramilitary rapid support forces who were set up by Bashir in 2013 to fight the counterinsurgency campaign in Darfur and to help to protect him against the risk of a military coup by the army. The Sudanese armed forces themselves, although they're a very old institution, were politicized massively in the 1990s by bringing a lot of members of the Sudanese Islamic movement, the Islamists, into the officer corps. So what we have now really is a war against Sudan's democratic transformation. And, you know, five years ago was a time of great hope when the world admired the courage and determination of Sudan's young men and women who were risking their lives to fight for freedom, peace and justice. These hopes collapsed in October 2021 when Himiti and Bohan and the Islamists joined forces to overthrow former Prime Minister Hamdok's civilian government. But even after that, uh, Sudan's youth continued to go out on the streets to protest against military rule. And even since the war started, those young people have joined the emergency response rooms who are providing humanitarian relief to their local communities. 
at great risk to their own lives. Many of them are being arrested by both sides. So it seems to me that if the UK and other Western governments want to support democracy, that sees Sudan as one of the most promising countries in the region for a democratic transition, let's not abandon these these guys, these democratic civilian forces in their hour of need. So, Mohammed, just pulling this together for us, what, what would you most like to see now in terms of some discussion or negotiation with all these countries involved that might bring Sudan a bit closer to peace and the kind of peace its c- civilians would like? Well, that's a very good question. I think there is um, there would be three steps have to taken um, immediately. Number one, uh, I think regionally and internationally, uh, we do need to unite it uh, behind one uh, platform. We've seen initiatives from IGAD and African Union also talk about this many times. We've seen a meeting in Manama and always we've seen a meeting in Jeddah. Those initiatives has to be one initiative where um, the neighbors of uh, Sudan's country and uh, regional organization and international uh, figures to come together behind one uh, platform. That is number one. Number two, I think a huge pressure is needed now to put on the war uh, parties because what I've seen every day, every day f- um, from news, from statements come up from the war party, especially uh, South, and uh, is not is not a good sign. So international has to come up with a very very strong pressure on the war party, especially those don't need to keep up the peace process on on the track. And number three, I think is very this is very important. Any negotiation between war party has no place for civilians. I don't think it could be reach uh, a peace. Uh, process where we can tackle all the problem. We've seen uh, many t- short uh, terms negotiation in Jeddah in absence of civilians. And I think that uh, alone is, is, is a lesson why we need to bring the civilians and stakeholders abroad to be part of any uh, political process. That would help to maintain the political process, uh, especially when it just need to start with the ceasefire, temporary ceasefire, to help in uh, humanitarian uh, access. And also, I think we need to put all the principles, the declaration of the, the solutions, the road causes issues on the board. If we need to sustain a peace and to bring about democracy in our uh, country, because this conflict, it linked with the history, it would link with the current political differences, and it could link with the future of this country. So we have to have a chance to talk about all the root causes to do with peace, to do with uh, the identity of the Sudanese people, to do with the democratic system, to be to do with uh, a single out uh, one army, uh, national army, and to get a distance from the politics. I mean, all the root causes we all know about them need to be on the table and need to be tackled if we need to end up this war for forever. Mohammed, thank you. You have, and so have the other two, made a really powerful case for why the world should be looking at Sudan now and trying to bring this awful conflict to some kind of resolution, though I can't say we have sprinkled a huge amount of optimism on that, but we have at least talked about the possible way forward. We're going to have to stop there. A big thank you to my guests, Rosalind Marsden, James Copnell, Mohammed al Taishi. Do follow them all on X, Twitter. Their details will be in the show notes. And a reminder that you can find all of our podcasts on all major platforms, as well as through our social media. So do like, follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. To read more from our experts or to find out more about the many events we've got coming up, don't forget to visit chathamhouse.org and you can find there the work of the extensive work of our big and distinguished Africa program. It's goodbye from me, Bromin Maddox. See you next week. 